Hello everyone. This is the first time that um, we have been in um, in video contact um, and it's good to know uh, that for the first time you will get a sense of my voice uh, as well as uh, how I do things, how I approach things. It's much easier when I'm talking. Well, um, first I would like to say uh, that we are proceeding quite well in terms of the discussion online uh, and I would I have enjoyed it very much and I encourage you to respond to the posts of other people as well that opens up um, dialogue uh, and Yes, it's good to plan. On the other hand, um, sometimes spontaneous, very spontaneous posts are really the right way, right way to go as well. Uh, and I hope by now you've got access uh, to the online version of the textbook through Pearson. Uh, don't want to go that route, you can always purchase the textbook uh, through Amazon. Okay, to, to start to today's um, I was going to say dialogue because I like to imagine people in the background responding or thinking. Okay, so the first point I want to make today actually is um, in the form of a question, which is given uh, that we can all um, use video as I am, uh, given that we can all use our iPhones, uh, given that we can all use Zoom, uh, and also th that we can uh, have voice contact through all kinds of uh, telepathy, uh, telephony, which is a hard word to, to pronounce, but that's what I mean. Um, or we could just get out of our offices, walk down the hall, knock on somebody's door, or uh, smile at somebody in a cubicle, uh, and then invite a discussion. So why bother with the writing piece? which in both the academy and in the workplace is, is a lot more time-consuming and uh, can be quite stressful and will involve a lot more work. Uh, and that really is an important starting point for us, which is to recognize that writing has a huge value for businesses and, and for also in, in the academic world. And I guess the first point would be that it's more lasting. Um, yes, you can save uh, a speech. For sure, you can save, uh, you know, as in a TED Talk, record it for all time, maybe. But the easiest way to keep a record of something that has happened at work is, quite simply, to use email to have a record, a clear record. So writing has a staying power that is important. And we could add to that that writing has a flexibility as well, because if you get an email, you may choose to read the, the um, attention line, the subject line, and the first few words, and that's it. Come back later and read the whole thing. Maybe not read the whole thing until later in the week or the following week. So, two, we can travel further with writing. You can send a message to anyone anywhere in the world. Yes, you could do that um, by voicemail as well, by video, by Zoom, yes. But if you have written a message, then the person reading it um, can ponder, reflect, respond. Um, and there are huge values for the writer as well, because in the process of composing, uh, the writer thinks and clarifying thinking clear thinking uh, in research and on the job is really an important goal for us. The critical thinking, yes, but I'm thinking of something more basic, which is, is just to think clearly, okay, what is the situation? Uh, you know, can I describe it for someone else? What is there a problem? What is this problem? What are the possible solutions? Reading all of that, writing all of that, involves clarifying for yourself what is really going on. Okay, so the writing piece is important, and, and if this was face-to-face, -face, we would be doing a lot more talking, and if this was synchronous and we were using um, Zoom, 
we would also have more chance for talk. But I think the huge value of this venue, which is asynchronous and involves a lot of writing and responding to the discussion questions, has a lot of benefits. Because even in the first two weeks of the course, I think I can see writers coming to terms with their own writing abilities and moving forward with it. So if you're looking to improve your skills in writing, this venue um, is a, will prove effective for you. Now, just to clarify, when we say synchronous and asynchronous, um, we are referring to the time sense. So with synchronous, everybody would be meeting at the same time and maybe in the same place. But with asynchronous, you can tune in um, to the course when it suits you best. Uh, and that's better for time management if you have full-time family responsibilities or full-time work um, apart from going to school. So um, I ha am a great believer in asynchronous, actually. I, I think the, the potential for it um, the flexibility of asynchronous is huge. Okay, if we think for a few minutes about the kind of writing that might be appropriate in this course, um, and I will just say right off the bat, um, the kind of writing that is not effective, and then that is long paragraphs, a lot of free-flowing as in... Um, uh, lots of digressions, no focus, or, or sort of rambling. <clears throat> so we're looking at writing that has a strongly practical dimension. And um, a lot of the textbooks and business education in general likes lists. And we think of the C's, you know, what are the various C's? What kind of writing is effective in terms of these C's? Um, okay, clear. Concrete, concise, comprehensive, considerate, competent, capable, contemporary. Well, we could go on and on from there. Um, but if you think about the need for brevity and clarity, uh, that's a good way to get going. So in my case, as the reader of a lot of what you write, evaluator, I am not looking for long documents. No to long documents. So brevity is uh, sometimes not easy to achieve. Um, you know, um, we, we say that simplicity too is, is elusive, but clear, concise uh, writing, yes, let's keep that in mind as a focus from now through to the end of the course. And I do try to remind people in the last assignment, which is, which is by nature um, a, a lengthy document, I do remind people, do not think that length is going to um, be a, a positive feature in the end, because it won't be. Okay, we will certainly go down that route of how much writing is enough um, from one assignment through to another. Okay, so if we think of business writing, uh, we are going to consider purpose. Yes, why send out emails if there's no need for it whatsoever? Uh, and that's one of the biggest problems at work, I think, is that we all get way too many messages that are not necessary uh, in terms of actions to follow or um, copied on, on messages in regard to issues that don't pertain to our job at all. Um, and, you know, when I mention clear writing, I think it starts with the, uh, the subject line. Um, one of my pet peeves is that people do not do enough to clarify what they are writing about in the subject line. That's a place to begin. And if we look at um, academic writing, we can think of the title. Now, I like titles. I like titles that anticipate thesis statement, even your own perspective on a topic. So right at the beginning, to clarify uh, the topic, yes. And um, the purpose, yes. What do I want to do with this writing? Am, am I trying to inspire people, motivate them, 
change their thinking, get them to do something? Am I trying to pass on some necessary pieces of information to complete a routine task? Or am I involved in a new initiative in the organization? And I have to explain to people why the organization is going toward this new way of doing things. So uh, it's a case of deciding, am I going to use narrative? Am I going to tell a story? Am I going to persuade people to do something new? Am I going to change people's thinking? Or am I going to provide information? And is it going to be information that must be understood at first reading of the document? So clarity will be necessary. And to clarify, I may have to use bullets or headings uh, or lists. And if it's an email, uh, in fact, if it's any kind of business document, that is okay. And in academic business writing, um, in business courses, headings help enormously. Okay, so the kind of writing for this course uh, is not going to be the same as from English 30 way back when um, in high school. Okay, if we think of business writing and academic writing and what they share in terms of purposes, um, we come to research. A lot of business writing is researched writing. Uh, and I think people forget that. It's researched. The research may involve rereading um, a chain of emails dealing with a particular issue. It may be talking to people in an organization, doing a questionnaire or survey of people. Uh, and it will certainly involve a search for facts, for facts. Uh, the same is true in academic writing. You will be involved in researching databases, all kinds of sources for the opinions of others and also for the history of a particular pressing and pressing issue. In both cases, um, the thinking part goes with the writing part. So the better you think, the more likely it is that you will write effectively. Okay, now at the beginning of um, a course that involves writing, we could spend a lot of time talking about communication models, theories of how people communicate. And even if you just glance at the opening of our textbook, the first chapter, you will see models that show um, the sender, the message, the receiver, and then the feedback loop. So we see this as, um, uh, I, it's recursive in the sense that we repeat that all the time. That is, talk to one person, two people, a group of people, large audience, um, and then we would expect some questions and then we answer, and so it goes around in a form, a loop. Now, we could too, um, look at the assignments in this course in terms of the role of the sender, um, the purpose of the message, and what the written text in front of us, and then look at what the receiver, the reader, the audience will get out of the text. Um, but that in itself could become a lengthy theoretical discussion, and we have no time for that. In fact, the time piece, yes, the time piece is crucial. And that's one of the things I enjoy about this course, the time thing. Okay, so here in British Columbia, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, depending on where you live, it will be a different time. And, but, but time for, uh, and deadlines. Those are so important in the workplace and in the academic world as well because we want to know when was this research done? Was it last year? Uh, when did it get published? Is it about to be published but hasn't been published yet? What happened 30 years ago on this topic? So the time, time, when, 
Yes, when. And of course, those questions, when, where, who, why, how. Yes, all the reporters type questions come into account. But let's go back for a minute to consider these three basic components of communication, the sender. So I begin talking uh, always with my own perspective. Okay, who am I? Do I even know who I am as a sender? You know, um, what's my age, stage, education, family situation, beliefs, morals, concerns for ethical issues and dilemmas? Am I very strongly concerned right now about my health, health issues, COVID-19? And, you know, what's my religious background? What's my ethnic background? What are the biases in the culture in which I grew up? Or what would I say were the strengths in that culture? So all of that is going to shape the kind of writing that I do, even if it is um, a routine message such as uh, and that asks a question and then gives a timeline. It might be something like, um, uh, dear team members, uh, please send me your reports on um, last month's sales records by Friday end of day. And then uh, I look forward to seeing how things went last week. Sign my name. Um, now, you may already have picked up confusion in that communication by end of day. Now, end of day, if you're all in the same workplace, we might agree on the time. So it would be more precise if I look again at that message, I would probably erase that and come up with something like, by um, the 10th of May um, at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That would be a lot clearer. Okay, so I have to situate myself as the writer, as the sender. Okay, so that takes us to the text, the writing part, which might include a lot of other visuals, sure. But so what am I going to do with the text. Well, okay, what is the purpose of this communication? What is the main idea that I want to convey? And then the next part is, to whom am I addressing this message? Who's going to read it anyway? Now, if the message is so convoluted that no one is going to want to read it, then I will have to revise I will have to waste a lot of time resending a message that wasn't clear in the beginning. Okay, now that then takes us to the receiver. Okay, the reader, the audience. So I will also have to put myself in the shoes of the reader and the audience. Who are these people? You know, how much do they know about the topic? Do they have any interest in this topic? Um, are they going to be receptive to doing what I need them to do? Or will they be hostile and angry and bitter? Or are there people I've worked with before who are friendly, cooperative, and I need not worry too much about offending them in any way? But to begin with, I will have to have a very clear sense of who these people are. Now, if it's to my boss, I may feel quite nervous about the communication, but maybe the communication will also be sent to co-workers who, for, to a certain extent, are friends as well as colleagues. Okay, lots of questions around this would occur uh, on any kind of reflective process. For one thing, is the message that the receivers get the same as what I am sending as the writer. Well, there may be some deviance. I, uh, and in some ways, that doesn't matter um, as long as the main message comes through. Um, but we do worry 
if people don't get what we are trying to say and um, the message that we're trying to send. Okay, now, as you know from looking at the textbook and maybe from taking other courses um, in communication and from the discussion in the first couple of weeks in this course, we see writing, we see writing in terms of three steps, pre-writing, writing, and revising. And we could add um, a, third, a fourth step, which would be proofreading. And there are various steps in revising itself. Okay, so the whole textbook is organized around various ways to apply the three-step writing process for different assignments, from a simple email, if there is such a thing, through, through to a complex report. So the three-step writing process. Now you could pick this out of any one of the chapters. So, and usually uh, it's set up in blue and orange, the blue and orange three-step writing process. First step, planning. Analyze the situation, define your purpose and develop an audience profile, gather information, determine audience needs and obtain the information necessary to satisfy those needs. Select the right medium. Select the best medium, and in other words, the kind or genre. That is, am I going to make this a blog, put this up in a blog? Uh, is this going to uh, come through to people um, in hard copy in a letter? Is it in the form of an email? Uh, or am I going to send a memo? M which Actually, today, very few people use the memo format, um, but everybody uses um, email. Um, or am I going to report on something? Am I going to use one of the report formats? Is it a proposal? Okay, now that would take up probably 50% of your time. And, you know, when I first started um, using this text... When I looked at the three-step writing process, I thought to myself, well, who's have got time for all of this? And certainly to spend 50% of my precious writing time planning, you know, I don't do that. I sit with my fingers on the keyboard. I do touch typing and off I go. But no, if there's one thing that I've learned, it is the planning stage is crucial to the success of the document. Okay, so the writing part, by the time you get to it, is the easiest. You adapt to your audience, be sensitive to audience needs by using the word you, being polite, positive, being emphatic, and trying to be unbiased. And you try to establish a strong relationship with your audience um, by establishing your own credibility um, and connecting, if possible, to the company's mission uh, and in, in terms of um, discipline-based writing at the university um, in reflecting the uh, key aspects of the discipline, that is the business discipline. Okay, then you write through using the strongest words you can find, the clearest language, and then you complete the process by revising, revising, uh, and then producing the message, proofreading, and distributing. Yes, the, um, the distribution part can be tricky as well because um, I think copying people on messages is uh, often rather unfortunate because uh, people never look at it or spend all their time being copied on stuff that's not relevant. Okay, distribution part. Okay, that, that would take us then to um, the big issue of, of week two in the course, which is uh, the reader and the audience. Now, I actually see a difference. Reader is likely to be one person or a small group of readers. But an audience may be very large. You know, it may be huge, several thousand people. Who knows? So an audience is a much wider perspective on readership. Readers tend to be closer to you, um, easier to write for because you may know them. It's a more intimate connection. 
And we could say a lot about readership. The fact that professional writers often have an ideal writer in mind, often have a particular reader in mind. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a family member, sometimes it's a colleague, or sometimes it's what we call the common reader or construct of somebody who's very much like we are, somebody with the same level of education and the same interests in business. That is, if you're interested in the numbers, in the quantitative part of business, you imagine yourself writing for somebody else who's interested in statistics and maybe somebody who is expert in the field who could interpret statistics the way you would like to have them interpreted. All right, um, and I'm going to um, briefly, you'll, you'll hear, I want to read you two paragraphs, <coughs> excuse me, that have <coughs> a different sense of reader. And you will hear it immediately. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. There's example number one and example number two. And the topic is smoking. Paragraph number one. Certainly, it's challenging to give up smoking when the pleasures of cigarettes have been with you throughout your adult life. Yet medical evidence steadily mounts on the dangers of tobacco. Moreover, smoking in public places is severely limited, and lighting up anywhere near most public buildings is prohibited by law. In the last few years, smoking in restaurants is no longer tolerated. Owners of eateries try to create separate areas for smokers, but you must agree that this segregation is an interim measure. Okay, that's one. This is two. Owners of busy restaurants today are faced with the dilemma. If they do not comply with the no smoking laws, they will be closed by authorities. And if they do not allow smoking areas, they will lose customers. The answer is to plan for areas that can be devoted to non-smokers and slightly smaller spaces that are reserved for smokers. The smoking areas can be located in outside patios and screen decks. That way, both the needs of smokers and non-smokers can be accommodated. So in the first example, I'm writing for somebody who smokes, who maybe has tried to quit but can't, and wants to eat out. And in the second case, I'm writing for owners of restaurants who recognize that there are people who are smoking and does not want to say that nobody can smoke anywhere on the street or anywhere at all around the restaurant. Okay, in the first case, I've made a concession to the reader. Admittedly, it's challenging to give up smoking, and I've admitted that there's a pleasure in smoking. Okay, now, so there's a different reader in number one than in number two, and I'll be sending this to you as a file so you can look yourself. Okay, I wrote both paragraphs, but what I would probably do today if I were looking at the same issue when we are very much hoping next weekend that at least a few restaurants will be open for a few eaters to find places separate from others and maybe even eat outside, I would go about this paragraph quite differently. I would write for the owner of a restaurant, and I would also want to take into the picture somebody who's dying to go out somewhere, buy, or maybe buy a cup of coffee and um, a Danish and smoke a cigarette. So, uh, the COVID crisis has changed everything um, and will change the sense of readership as well. So that's, that's something uh, to consider that with each topic, in fact, in this whole course, it's before COVID and now in the middle of the COVID crisis. Okay, in your textbook, you will see that um, the writers advise us strongly to create an audience profile. 
Yes, an audience profile. Okay, who's your primary audience? How big is your audience? Where are they located? What is your audience's composition? What is your audience's level of understanding? What is your audience's probable reaction? So all of this you could jot down on paper, you could write it out, make a file, do what you can, but you need to write it out. So the purpose of this is to establish credibility with readers, um, to discover what information is relevant to them, what information they need to do their jobs, and what they want to know. Okay, you can also create a plan sheet. Main message, audience questions, audience possible reaction. And of course, you have to have a clear sense of the purpose in writing as well. So if we flip back to um, a sense of essay, of course, there is purpose, and then there is the main idea, which is thesis statement. So uh, what you know about essay writing and what um, and we're exploring in this course about business writing, these two come together nicely for us. And the more you know about essay writing, um, the better your business messaging potentially uh, could become. Okay. Um, now, at, at this point, it's clear that some of the readers and that um, part of the audience uh, will react differently. That is, um, it, that the challenge is to get through to a large mixed audience, but also to get through to somebody who uh, may have worked with you in the past and doesn't like you, how to write for a professor uh, who has been giving you low grades and, and who seems to take a very negative perspective of you. And that, to how to write for the negative reader or viewer. You know, uh, how do you do this? Well, the textbook explains this at some length, and, and, I, and I'm going to focus on this many times in the course, and the, the one time at this point um, is to consider um, direct and indirect ways of connecting with readers and audiences. And the basic principle is this. If people are hostile... If people will not like what you were telling them to do or telling uh, them about or the information you're communicating, or if they don't like you either, or if they are just basically disinterested or bored, it's best to start indirectly. In other words, get people on your side. And to do that, um, you may wish to use a buffer. That is a general statement or a positive statement. But thank you for the work you did last week on improving our sales. That's a buffer statement. And very often, beginning with thank you is a good thing to do. Or um, even with a question. We're establishing common ground. If, on the other hand, you are writing for somebody um, who is uh, friendly, open, courteous, and you yourself are using that approach, then being direct, clear, would you please send this to me by tomorrow at 2 o'clock, that approach will work. So one of the basic concerns in messaging at work is to determine whether to use a direct approach or indirect. And we've been talking about that in the discussion questions. Always it comes back to direct or indirect approaches to messaging. And your textbook will provide you with numerous examples, numerous examples of how that works. Okay, now the final um, bit of information to add to that which will be useful to you next week, is um, <clears throat> an approach to selling, persuading, 
and to both indirect and direct messaging, and is and that is what we call ADA. The ac- an ac- acronym is ADA. A I D A. So, ADA, get readers' attention, provide them with information, direct them to ways in which they can get the product or make the shift, and then repeat what you have said um, by anticipating any questions that they may have and uh, anticipating how the product is different from other products available to them um, and then try to motivate them for the last time to go in the direction you want, which could be to buy a product. Ada, capture the reader's attention, build interest in a potential solution to the problem, and then uh, increase the reader's desire or willingness to take action, and finally motivate the reader one last time. Ada, attention, Interest, desire, action. Ada. Consider that. And it all comes back to beginning with something that is a reader benefit. So that's the you centered approach once more. That is, business writing is reader based prose. Okay, um, that, that's enough for, for this recording. But I am going to end you <laughs> end here with <laughs> um, with a very uh, with a mini case study, and uh, I'll send this to you online, and and I'm I'm going to uh, summarize it here, and the question will be what writing might be involved in this situation. Okay. Consider the case of Amber. How would you respond if Amber reported to you? What should the organization do? But it all comes back to, of course, the writerly question. Is any writing required in dealing with this situation? Okay, Amber is an administrative assistant who has started out well on the job, but um, has begun to show some strange, inconsistent behavior. She began by arriving late, calling in sick, and uh, she began borrowing and refusing to pay money from friends and colleagues at work, and then got angry with uh, customers on the phone. So then one day, after being found in, in in the bathroom, sniffing white powder, she was confronted about a cocaine problem and reacted by quitting immediately leaving a hole in the organization for months before a replacement could be found. If you were the manager, that is the person to whom Amber responded um, and reported to, what would you do in terms of writing? What writing could you do? What writing should you do? Would any writing be required? Okay, I leave you with the case of Amber, and I don't promise to do recordings every week, um, but I will be doing them at three or four other times in the course. And my final note always is, keep on writing. I am a writer, and I love to write.